can't grow a beard, Tim. You've got, you're a beta male, you've got too low testosterone. What's this then? Huh? It's a beard. What's going on on the old YouTubes? Hmm, let's see. Oh, fuck, fuck! <sighs> Michael Rollins? Ugh. Uh, ContraPoints. Decrypting the alt right. Ooh. Be describing the particular strategies that yes. YouTube used to code their ideas and make them more palatable oh, yeah. to conservatives, centrists, and liberals. Woo. Strategy one outright denial. <laughs> Yep. Never reveal your power level. <laughs> Disavow anyone who ah. reveals their power level. Oh, yeah. This means that if someone Contra acts points. like a fat ContraPoints is a much more popular and high quality YouTuber than I'll ever be. Constantly shift their terminology in order to avoid the negative connotations that develop around the names of their people. He's, if anything, an Asian supremacist. And then you'll get sucked into arguing about IQ instead of talking about the fact that the main goal of the politics he supports is the political and social supremacy of white people over all other Americans and Europeans. In other words, <laughs> no, 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 no. Ah. It was all just a horrible dream. I wasn't really white at all. <laughs> I just wanted to test out my new camera. Hopefully it looked okay. This video is a sort of spiritual follow-up to a previous video I made talking about this tweet I sent out. In my previous video I discussed some of the substance of what I was saying in that tweet, but there was something else that came out of it that got me thinking and so I decided to make a video about it. A lot of the responses said stuff like, It's so horrible that you're ashamed to be white. That you hate being a white person. That you think white people are all guilty for everything that's happened through history. That you don't like your own culture. That you don't like your own people. And it just got me thinking about the idea of white guilt. What that really means. And just my ideas about that. Whether I have white guilt. I mean, obviously, I'm a disgusting social justice cuck. Which means that I probably hate this sick skin color, but I do have some Jewish blood, so that means I'm not really white. So, I mean, I'm just gonna go by the definition of being white looking. So I guess I think it's really gross that I was born with this skin. Ugh. Yuck. Do I have white guilt? Do I feel any kind of shame about being white? Is there anything wrong with being white? No. Why would there be? That doesn't make any sense to me. White in terms of just an idea of a certain type of person that looks a, 
certain way is just what I am. And there's a whole bunch of other people in the world who are white. When I think about race, to me, it's neutral. It doesn't mean anything at all. So if there was a picture of a Maori person standing there, I would just say, oh, look, it's a Maori person. If there was a picture of an Asian person, I'd say, it's an Asian person. If there's a picture of a white person, oh look, that person's white. That doesn't mean anything. That's completely neutral. Like the fact that I'm white doesn't mean anything to me. It means nothing. I'm just white. That's just what I am. At least in terms of our idea of what that is. But you see, race and appearance being neutral is not the same as not seeing race. If white people are just now discovering that it's bad for black or working class people in America, they're a lot more blind than I thought. And they're a lot more choosing to be ignorant than I thought. The same problems that we're discussing today, we discussed in 1990, 1980, 1970, and 1960. And until we call a spade a spade and we say that this problem is coming from conditions that we're creating or allowing to happen as a white group of people who hold a certain amount of power, not seeing race is more about not acknowledging racial messaging, not acknowledging that things can be racist. For example, there are tests where they show a black hand holding a product and then they show a white hand holding a product. On their own, that shouldn't mean anything because there's no messaging going on there. It's just, that's a black hand, that's a white hand. But when people look at that, they were less likely to be attracted to the product that was being held by a black hand. Now, if race is neutral, it doesn't mean anything, which is my belief. Why do they have that reaction? Because they've been conditioned to see race and come to a negative reaction about it. And the way that's done is through social messaging. So if I see a picture of a white person, it doesn't mean anything. But if I see a picture of a white person in a frame and it says, Hail Hitler on top of it, I think it's related to this social racist phenomenon. If I see a black person just standing there looking like a black person, I'm like, that doesn't mean anything to me. But if they're standing there with like a backwards cap and they're like holding some guns and they've got gold chains and stuff, which wouldn't necessarily be hyper negative, maybe I would be like more cautious about it. But then you put it in a frame for like a conservative organization, which is trying to fear monger about black crime, and then they're doing political messaging where they could elicit a racist response in people. So that's why like being a certain race doesn't mean a damn thing, like it doesn't mean anything at all, me being white. But if I think about being white in relation to things that white people have done throughout history, and in relation to other white people being really racist, and maybe in relation to other people who have prejudices against white people, then I'm starting to see race through a more racialized lens. And then the whole equation kind of changes and social conditioning comes in. You have been socially conditioned in some fashion. I have, you have, everybody has. Just some people take that social conditioning to a much further level and say, I want a white ethno state or whatever. And some people just want to deny it and pretend like I, I don't, I don't, I'm, I've got no awareness of anything. I'm just a babe in the woods. Whereas I think it's healthy to become aware of your own biases and become aware of how messages might affect you and how you think. But just on a level of abstract principles, I think race is neutral. It's also impossible to deny that we live in a world where it does mean something in the world. It shouldn't, but it does. Then what is white guilt? Why should a white person ever say, I don't like what's happening to these minorities. This group of people has been treated hideously in history for what example happened to the Native Americans and there's a very good video by Sean and Jen about it and me as a New Zealander will recommend a British person's video about American history because we can't mind our own business. The question becomes about the collective versus the individual. Now often on the internet when I'm talking to ideological opponents They'll say things like, You social justice cuck warrior, you believe in the collective. You believe human beings are part of a collective and you have a collectivist mindset. <laughs> and normally that's in the context of, that's why I'm going to do some horrible tactic to you or treat you terribly or say terrible things about you because that's something you would do with your collective ideology. Therefore, it's justified when I do it. And I'm a massive hypocrite. Yeah. But as far as I'm concerned, unless you are a lunatic, anarcho-capitalist, or some other fringe person who has beliefs that don't make any sense at all, like extreme libertarianism or something, everything is just do whatever the fuck you want, like cats sleeping with dogs, and they don't have political ideas which are actually applicable to anything. Ah, uh, the old who will build the roads. <laughs> 
Rose, Rose, Rose. Where we're going, we don't need Rose. Because the truth is, is that in, in the future we'll have a jetpack. This is ah! unimaginative. They don't see a future where freedom can solve the problems that, that, that are created by government. The free market can solve these problems. Take a look at what happened in Hurricane Katrina when people were suffering and there was no electricity. What happened? People stepped in and they started offering generators. And people said, oh, wow, look, they're charging for these generators two, three times more than you might have learned on the free market. But they called them price gougers. But the truth is, is that supply and demand worked. And it uh, looks like I'm out of time, but uh, who will build the roads? My roads. We don't need that. We don't need government to build roads. Are we I, not psychic wait, about wait libertarians? No, wait a second. Oh, uh, my God. I didn't even know. Jetpacks. You had written right here. It was... Uh, jetpacks. He said, oh, you said Peterson says we won't need roads. I was guessing about the jetpacks. Besides, those people who just have the most ridiculous political beliefs that they're just a joke. Everybody is to some extent a collectivist. If you believe in society, you are a collectivist. And a lot of the people who say, I'm a radical individualist, if you ask them, well, do you believe that the government should exist? Yes, like, why should a government exist? So they can collect some taxes to just do the basics. Why should they do the basics at all unless there is some element of collectivism? Because we're in a society. Now, am I more of a collectivist than some of those people? Yes, I am, because I think society should be more organized for the sake of all people, and that is more collectivist. I'm willing to say what my beliefs are and say, yes, all of the basics should be provided to human beings because we're all part of a human brotherhood and sisterhood and whatever elsehood. And we should be able to share to a certain extent and the fruits of our labor. We all share rights that we've created through a social contract, etc. Whereas these other people are like, I'm just a total individualist. Everything is just about extreme individual, which is not true. They're not extreme individualists. They're people who are individualist minded, but they still believe in collectivist ideas pertaining to a shared society. And that's a lot of people who say that I'm, I'm like a classical liberal. When it comes to individualism, I also have a strong social individualism streak because I believe people should be able to express themselves however they want to express themselves. If you're doing it on YouTube, maybe there's a terms of service, etc. So there's nuance to that conversation. I think people should be able to put whoever the fuck they want into their bodies, like drugs. People should be able to marry whoever the fuck they want. People should have full autonomy over their bodies. They should have the right to petition their government. But they should also have the right to life. And a big part of that is having access to healthcare and a home. And that should not be prohibitive to anybody in a society if it wants to be a free society. So in my view, there is overlapping elements of individualism and collectivism. And only a fucking idiot would say, I'm a total collectivist in every way. There's no such thing as individualism. Which is bullshit because people can express themselves. And that's sort of one of the elements of individualism. And somebody who says, I'm only an individualist, I don't think you could take their ideas of how society should look seriously because they're just utopian and they're actually kind of emotionally manipulating you by saying if everything is not individual it's automatically bad. Be scared, be afraid. And then that relates to the ideas of white guilt or collective guilt. In my country of New Zealand, white people have fucked over Maori people which has resulted in generational poverty. The fact is that before 1840 Māori and European got on remarkably well. There were two reasons for this, sex and guns. Before 1840, the settlers living in New Zealand were mostly men. They were linked into tribal society by formal or informal marriages to Māori women, a treaty made in bed. A three-week sex contract with a Māori woman usually cost one musket and one dress. By the 1830s, the sex trade became New Zealand's biggest industry. The Treaty of Waitangi was signed here in February 1840. After signing, Māori expected to continue to run their own affairs with the authority of the new governor restricted to the Europeans. Fitty, fitty. But the governors expected to run the whole country. Māori and Pākehā expectations of the treaty bargain soon clashed. Nearly 140 years ago, the peaceful, peaceful settlement of Parihaka, south of New Plymouth, was sacked by Crown troops and its men jailed without trial in the South Island and the women who were left behind raped. In 1881, the Taranaki settlement had become a symbol of peaceful resistance against land confiscation under the leadership of Prophets Te Fiti, Oronga Maia and Tohu Kakahi. Te Manu Korehi reporter Shannon Haunui Thompson was in Parihaka for the apology and signing of the reconciliation settlement. 
Maori people live in lower economic decile areas, they struggle more at school, they have a lot more difficulties, and then the government creates policies to try and compensate or deal with those inequalities. So is that, a, is that your target then? Are you committing to one tonight of bringing 100,000 kids out of poverty? Because you can actually make that a target. You've got a target for everything yes. else. Yes, I am committing to that. Jacinda Ardern, Bill English has just committed to a target on child poverty. What's your target? And I'm pleased about that because actually we've been asking him to do that for nine years. And that's the issue. Um, so I applaud that. But you see, the government can do that without it having anything to do with collective blame or guilt. You can just see that this area of society needs some extra help. And how do you justify that? Because you're a humanist who believes that society has to work for people so that they can live the best lives they possibly can within those parameters. And the world over, indigenous populations have been fucked over by white people. Like in Australia, the Aborigines, they were trying to breed them out, trying to destroy their culture and actually just get rid of them completely so that they didn't exist anymore. They did all kinds of horrific things to them. The Aborigines were deemed to be subhuman, little more than animals, which was to justify not only the theft of their land, but their extermination. An edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, still in circulation when I was at school, described them as only an animal of prey, more ferocious than the leopard or the hyena. He devours his own species. So they were hunted and raped and massacred. And few doubted at the time that genocide was official policy. A government report in the 1850s spoke of the success of poisoning Aborigines, 100 of them laid out at a time. But until quite recently, little of this was even acknowledged. In Tasmania, the Aborigines were said to have died out. In fact, they were hunted along with kangaroos and almost wiped out. In New South Wales, by 1845, the tribe who had watched Captain Cook sail here into Botany Bay was reduced to three women and a man. Eskimos in Canada. Residential schools are schools that were set up by the government of Canada, and there are other countries that have the same thing, but it was a policy that was put into place to bring all as many indigenous people as possible into these schools to educate them into the European way of life, to take you away from your culture, your language, all your traditions, and that's what it's about. In order to sever those ties in your culture and your language, they had to separate children from families and communities. We wore uniforms, you all dressed the same, you had your hair cut the same, you were all one. And it was too assimilate us to make sure we didn't have any Indian left in us when we finally left here. White people have raped and pillaged and maimed and destroyed. Now as an individual, how do I feel about that? It's not my fault. I didn't do any of it. Do I feel collective guilt? No, I don't believe in the idea of collective guilt and I don't believe in the idea of collective shame, but I do believe in the idea of collective responsibility. I know people will say when I say responsibility I'm just using a different word for guilt but you don't have to feel guilty while taking on a responsibility. You can choose to just ignore the generational problems and say I don't care if those particular groups in society struggle and live in poverty and you can just go about your life and just do whatever the fuck you want to do. No one's forcing you to care so you don't actually have to do anything. You're perfectly free to just live an entirely selfish life not giving a fuck about anybody else. But as a humanist, I think there is no harm in saying I can see these historical issues and it would probably be useful or positive for someone who looks like me to have a humanist mentality that I still would like to do whatever I could to fix historical wrong. Not because they were my fault per se, but because I would prefer to be someone who looks like me, who does good for the world, rather than be a massive douchebag. And we all share a collective responsibility for problems that are happening in society. Some have a great level of responsibility, such as people who are directly involved in making decisions that affect people's lives. Whereas others of us can choose to take on the responsibility of improving society. As an individual, you have the option to positively contribute to a collective. You have the option to not do that 
and just to be shit. And when it comes up, I would prefer to care and I would prefer to say what things could people be doing to improve this situation. People call that virtue signaling. I just call that being a basic human being. I think the fact that race is becoming such a big issue online reflects the fact that it tends to simmer beneath the surface. Ignoring our prejudices and the stereotypes that come to our minds is not healthy and it's not useful and you can't get anywhere with that. Ignoring negative things that white people have done in the past and just saying other races to shut the fuck up and you, nobody should ever see race at all because it's racist to acknowledge issues, that's not useful at all. And it's also completely nonsensical to personally beat yourself up over things that other people have done. It's simply a matter of saying, I'm a caring individual who cares about other human beings, so when I see that a certain group in society is struggling more and understanding that it was done by people who look like me but aren't me, that that is something that we should try to address because everybody deserves to have a decent life. The whole point is we should have shared values where we try to reduce that as much as we possibly can and that should not be something controversial. So white guilt? No, I don't believe in it. Collective guilt? No, I don't believe in that. Are white people bad? That's ridiculous. Doesn't make any sense. You would really have to explain what the fuck you mean by that. And even then, I'm not sure what it could mean. But recognizing systemic problems and wanting to contribute in a positive way and choosing to take on an element of collective responsibility because you want to improve mankind along with other individuals who wish to do the same. What the fuck's wrong with that? And that's my opinion. White!